Um, so that was that was very exciting. One of the the National Academy of Engineering has a set of grand challenges for the 21st century, and one of them is um, you know understanding the brain. And so um, it's really exciting to see the progress uh, the brain initiatives making um, under your leadership. Um, okay, so um, next I'd like to um, introduce our next speaker, um, Andrew Raden. And Andrew is a su successful technology entrepreneur, and he's brought his computational skills and experience to the, the world of uh, biopharmaceuticals. And um, one thing I should mention, uh, the, bio, I, the bio for me in the book is slightly out of date. And um, I actually know Andrew. I uh, recently joined the board of directors of Tuzar Pharmaceuticals, where Andrew's the founder, uh, co-founder, and CEO. Um, so, Andrew, looking forward to what you have to uh, tell us about. Absolutely. And thanks for the introduction. And I'm going to make the assumption my screen share is share is working unless I unless I hear otherwise. Uh, it's working great. Perfect. All right, great. So look, I would um, maybe like to start with a, a brief um, history of my work. I, I've, um, uh, before working in the field of life sciences, uh, I've worked extensively in large scale compute environments. Um, these are the systems that power the nation's telephones, calls, uh, large-scale advertising networks, uh, data services that live behind uh, large-scale mapping services that um, chances are you've been exposed to um, or, or even used software I've written, um, but, you, but you didn't even know it. And so given my expertise in computer science, I'm going to take a little time today to give you some background in artificial intelligence concepts and then tie that to our work in drug discovery, uh, walking you through an example in a prevalent chronic disease and I'll be highlighting uh, our work in lupus today. So first, you know, people, people often think that artificial intelligence is this new thing, uh, especially all of the press that it's received in the last few years. Uh, but the reality is it's been around since the dawn of computing. Okay, so back in the 70s, AI was associated with semantic networks. Uh, these are representations of knowledge by mapping concepts between objects. Uh, in the 80s, it was expert systems. This is coupling a, a knowledge base with an inference engine to drive new understanding. Uh, in the 90s, it was intelligent agents. Okay, these are machines that um, uh, they observe with sensors, if you will, and then they act upon the environment with actuators in a, in a feedback loop. Um, at the turn of the century, of course, the rise of big data, right? These are uh, specialized analysis methods that derive new knowledge where um, single threading uh, of analysis couldn't do the work. And then, of course, uh, eventually to more modern approaches like deep learning and neural nets. These are the algorithms that you hear a lot about today. And what's, what's happened over these uh, many years is that as compute and storage gets exponentially cheaper uh, and the algorithms get better, basically our ability to make more accurate predictions has improved. So what really is artificial intelligence? Well, I like to think of it as uh, it's, it's simply just a tool. And it's a tool that you can use to predict an event using real world data. Okay, so here's, here's a quick example on making weather predictions. Okay, so how can we accomplish this using artificial intelligence? Well, first, we collect some real world data. Okay, historical temperature, pressure, humidity, cloud cover, all those sorts of things. Okay, then we use artificial intelligence to process that data and make a prediction. Okay, and we have hundreds of AI algorithms to choose from, but ultimately we're gonna predict the weather for this afternoon or tomorrow or, or next week, some, some uncertain event. And this simple concept can be applied to other domains, right? Slap a camera on a car, start collecting visual data, and you know, like, is that a tree? Is that a pedestrian? Is that another car? Um, and, and this ability, if you will, for artificial intelligence to make predictions using real world data is very well suited for the life sciences. Now, if you think about drug discovery and development, if you think of these processes like I do, this, this whole thing from idea to FDA approval is just full of uncertainty, right? Like, is my experiments reproducible? Is my target disease modifying, right? Will my molecule dock with my target? Will my molecule dock with the target I don't want it to? Okay, so on and so forth. Like, like each of these is an uncertain event, okay? And so there, therefore, artificial intelligence has applications on all of the questions I just listed and many more, right? Like does my animal model characterize what will happen in human? Can I sign up enough patients for my clinical trial, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And so if you see this entire thing like I do, it's, it's this, this big decision matrix. Whoever makes the best decisions under this uncertainty is the person who's most likely to get new therapeutics to patients. 
Okay, and, and part of the reason that you'll find hundreds of companies and research teams uh, in the space using artificial intelligence is because that there are easily 100 problems to solve here uh, and, and possibly more. Now, we focus on using artificial intelligence in the earliest uh, phases of discovery. Okay, so we're focused on creating first-in-class medications for complex disease. And we're doing this because we believe the biggest opportunity to address uh, unmet medical need is by addressing new biology and then using that knowledge to create new medications. Uh, so we don't source new biological understanding from the literature, uh, but rather we use our computational modeling systems to drive new insights that others have not pursued in specific disease areas. Okay, so in terms of our drug products, we are a small molecule company. And let me walk you through an example of our work in a, 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 pro, a prevalent chronic disease. So lupus affects about 400,000 people in the US, about 5 million globally. Uh, it's much more prevalent in women, uh, typically with an age of onset during the childbearing years. And it's a very interesting disease because it results in a dysfunctional immune response um, in the normal process that the body uses to get rid of dead cells. Okay, so this can lead to pain and inflammation throughout the body. Um, lupus, the, the symptoms can be mild or severe. They can go up and down over time. It's got a wide range of clinical presentation. Uh, so like rash is the most common mild symptom. Uh, kidney inflammation is the most uh, um, serious common problem. And so because lupus is an inflammatory disease, therapy often starts with the safest anti-inflammatory drugs, the NSAIDs, okay? And while they're safe, they aren't that effective for most lupus patients. Um, unfortunately, the more effective drugs are also more toxic. So for example, uh, lupus patients with severe kidney inflammation, they're often given cyclophosphamide, which is a cancer drug from the 50s, which has some pretty extreme side effects uh, like infertility, uh, birth defects. If that wasn't bad enough, it can cause the inner lining of your blood vessels to fall off and clot up. It, it's it, a whole host of other problems as well. Okay, so as a result, you can't take it very long. And so there's this high amount need for a drug that would be both effective and well tolerated, right? Um, and that would require a mechanism of action that's different than the drugs that are currently being used for lupus, um, because it's a drug's MOA that's responsible for its basic efficacy and toxicity. Okay, okay. So finding a new MOA is exactly what what our technology allows us to do. And we've completed screening. We've got two molecules, uh, 711 and 712. Now each of them have a different MOA. Uh, and we're continuing to develop uh, each of them. Now, both of these molecules um, in standard in vivo models, uh, we see significant improvements in organ function uh, while seeing significant decreases in, in, uh, in inflammation. And with both these molecules, we see minimal body weight changes, um, which is a strong indication of good tolerability. So here's an overview of the discovery process that identified our leading lupus candidates. Okay, the first steps are computationally intensive. And as we move from the left to the right on this chart, uh, rely more on human insight, okay? And this represents the process we use to identify uh, promising candidates for other indications as well. Now, it starts with an artificial uh, intelligence-driven drug discovery phase, if you will, to generate efficacy predictions, okay? So in this phase, we identify key biological features of the disease and then map that to molecules, okay? Identifying those with the highest predicted efficacy. Now we do this by building an in silico model of the disease uh, using biological data like gene expression or microRNA data, uh, protein expression, uh, clinical data, phenotypical data. Uh, we use, for example, the FDA's uh, pharmacovigilance data uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so with lupus, we combined about 25 different orthogonal data sources on the disease. Uh, we then process this data with over 60 different methods that work together in concert to identify key features of the disease that could be then mapped onto a molecule library. Okay, and so that mapping went on to a library of 2 million compounds, uh, each with known chemistry, um, but there was a filtering step uh, to uh, initially get that down to about 50,000 molecules that were most appropriate uh, for the goals of the program. Now, the algorithms then identified uh, which molecules have the highest predicted efficacy out of that subset. Okay, and this typically generates uh, quite a few hits for us. Uh, in lupus, it was about 3,000. So in the next step, uh, we screen those hits, uh, looking at the MOA, the safety profile, uh, ADME properties. Uh, and so our scientific team here, they're annotating the system with disease-specific thresholds, and then the computer helps select the best candidates. 
Okay, so for example, thresholds for acceptable uh, safety, you know, they're, they're indication specific, right? So for example, um, we would include cytotoxic compounds when exploring oncology, but certainly not here in lupus, okay? Um, the requirement for a novel MOA is, a, is another general screening requirement. And so we, um, uh, we, if you will, train the system on things that, that are known about the disease. So it has an ability to find new things. So after that comes hit diligence and selection. Okay, so here we examine uh, the MOA in detail, uh, seeing how it connects to the disease biology. Uh, we look at whether or not a, uh, an MOA could give rise to a, rise to a safety problem. Um, we also look pretty uh, closely at the IP around the molecule. And so for lupus, we did this for about 80 molecules. And this led to the selection of nine molecules, uh, each with a different MOA to take into a preclinical efficacy model. Now the preclinical efficacy models, these are industry uh, standard. Um, they typically represent a very severe form of the disease. Uh, we use a positive control that represents a high bar for efficacy. And we run these at contract research organizations that serve uh, the pharmaceutical community. And so what's exciting about this process is that the time it took uh, from launching to identifying the nine compounds for screening uh, took about four weeks. Okay, the preclinical test, the animal study was the longest part um, taking about three months. And so, you know, this is a huge improvement from, from, you know, beginning to end because that normally can take, you know, many, many years. Okay. So we, we tested these nine, nine compounds in a uh, mouse model of lupus. And let's have a, a quick look at the results. So this, um, this first slide shows the results on inflammation. Now, um, just to quickly give you a roadmap here, lower numbers are better. Okay. Um, in each graph, then I'm going to show you here uh, the vehicle, the placebo, if you will, is represented by the first gray bar. Uh, the positive control, which in this case is cyclophosphamide, that, that effective yet nasty drug I told you about earlier, uh, that is in red. And then in blue and green are our selected hits. Um, the stars here represent uh, statistical significance. And you can see here, here that 711 and 712 are certainly effective at reducing inflammation. But ultimately, preserving kidney function is the most important endpoint, okay? So here we're looking at uh, blood urea, nitrogen, and protein urea. Uh, these are standard clinical measures of renal function, uh, and it's ultimately what you want to preserve, right? So lower numbers, again, are better. Um, our results for 711 and 712, again, follow for, uh, for vehicle and cyclophosphamide. And so here we can see that 711 and 712, even though these are, these are unoptimized experimental molecules, um, they demonstrate some pretty strong efficacy in terms of renal function, and they compare favorably to cyclophosphamide, um, which in addition to being very effective, it's, it's been studied uh, for decades, and it's a very well-characterized molecule. Okay, and so this is great news because both efficacy and toxicity are driven by MOA, and we've got two compounds here with a different MOA from cyclophosphamide that provide similar efficacy but don't have the antiproliferative properties that drive the cyclophosphamide toxicity. Okay, so this gives you a rough sense of, of the power of what artificial intelligence can do. Uh, not only did we pull this off in a few months rather than years, but I would also note that we tested nine molecules and we got these two hits in vivo. And normally you test about 100 molecules in vivo and expect to get maybe one or two hits at this milestone. Now, it's not just lupus that we work on. I'm talking about it today, given the, the topic of the conference, but we have, we have similar promising results across our entire portfolio of 18 diseases. Uh, we focus primarily on fibrotic diseases, uh, immune and inflammatory, as well as oncology. And we have licensed out several of our disease programs to other pharmas such as Ono and Santan, uh, SK, and so on and so forth. So ultimately, you know, what we can provide for the scientific community is a new understanding of disease biology in chosen disease areas. Uh, we couple that, of course, with a set of compounds for screening, further optimization and development. And that all happens in collaboration with our uh, scientific team and our KOL network. And what we've been able to show is that we can discover and develop new first-in-class small molecules uh, and do that years faster and at much higher hitch rates um, at, at, at in vivo efficacy milestones than the traditional approach. So that is my time, and I will uh, hand it back over to Howie.